Уважаемые коллеги, доброе утро. Предлагаю начать. Dear guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, Andrei Klapic is not going to join us for this session. However, uh, I'm certain that uh, even uh, without distinguished Mr. Klapic, uh, we have uh, great uh, participation here. And we do have, for example, a well-known economist, uh, uh, Andres Eric Borg, the economist and Minister of Finance of uh, Sweden between 2006 and 2014, as well as Jag Jagesh Vitold Kolodka, who is not just a professor with uh, the Kosminski University, but also used to be Minister of Finance of Poland for two spells of time. And we also have Alexei Vedev and Sergei Drabyshevsky. So we are going to discuss economic policy horizons or prospects, I'd say. And that may sound like an abstract topic, which it isn't. Well, predicting the future course of uh, development for the global economy is nearly impossible. You know this joke about why God invented economists? Like, he wanted a, a good backdrop for meteorologists. So it's very difficult to predict how the global economy will evolve, particularly in such a volatile environment. And global rules? When they do apply, apply in a fragmentary fashion, and international institutions seem to be losing the role that was initially spelled out for them. And the new norm is that global indices are pretty much driven by the tweets by an American president and some other global leaders as well. There are also major, quite unexpected changes happening in certain countries, like in Russia yesterday. Uh, you may have heard we had a major reshuffle of the government. And judging by the yesterday's address by the president, uh, new set of priorities for this country is uh, more internally focused as opposed to external politi politically focused. And today we are going to discuss how global economy can continue to develop Also, we'll talk about how we can potentially spur the development of Russian economy, leveraging the experience of other countries, uh, particularly, I guess, the experience of Poland and Sweden. And here, I would like to uh, turn to Anders Eric Borg. So the international financial crisis in 2007-2008 was uh, driven by the huge uh, bubble in financial markets. However, Sweden first faced a similar crisis 15 years earlier, when uh, Sweden had this real estate bubble, and then the state had to intervene in order to save major banks. It is often considered that Swedish experience helped many European countries avoid uh, major debacles and major catastrophes in 2008. So what were the tools of economic policy that Sweden used in those times that uh, Russia and other European countries could benefit from, and uh, what are the well, what are the new tools for economic policy available to us today? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's a, a great honor to be here, and I think uh, uh, Gaidar has always been, I think, a leading Russian economist. I, I think his books, that the one that I've read in English, are are quite very, very, very important way to understand the Russian economy and the world economy. So it's great to be here. Well, I will basically have two messages. One is that um, we need no change, and the second is that we need change. So we don't need change in macroeconomic stability, but we do need structural reforms, particularly in the area of, of pension reform. So I, I think Sweden and Russia have quite similar frameworks for economic policy. We, we both have a very stringent framework for public finances. We have low public indebtedness. Uh, we have been able to use fiscal policy as a tool to stabilize the economy. We have floating exchange rates, inflation targeting as the main framework and quite stable banking systems. 
I do think that this is a framework that one should stick to. The reason that uh, my views are kind of bad weather economics is because I, I started out uh, as an advisor in 91 to the Swedish prime minister and on the economic side. And only uh, two weeks after I started in my new position, we had the first banking crisis. And then I came back to office in 2006 and, and we did a lot of structural reforms in 2007. In total, we cut taxes with 5% and cut expenditures even more. But then only a year in or so, uh, the, the global crisis started again. So I thought that basically my, my whole work career has been about economic crises. And I do think that that's the reason why we in Sweden have such a tight and conservative framework. And I, I do think the reason why you have the same here in Russia is the same reason. Back in uh, the early 90s, uh, in 1998, and in 2008, I think, and also in 14, it has been proven that uh, Russia and Sweden has a common feature, and that is that we are very cyclical economies. Russia, because you have this big exposure to commodities, which is almost 70% of your export, uh, and Sweden, because we also have a large commodity exposure. We have 80% of European iron ore market. We have a large paper and pulp sector. And most of our manufacturing industry is in capital goods like uh, Scania, Volvo, and, and such that are very sensitive to the global business cycle. And if when you have a, a high degree of operational risk in your country, you need to have a low degree of, of financial risk. And uh, countries like Sweden and Russia will never have the benefit of the doubts from the markets. We have a welfare state that the Anglo-Saxon market never will trust. And, and you are in a, a special position being often in viewed as, as different from the rest of Europe. So I do think that for a country like Russia and a country like Sweden, it's extremely important to have a conservative fiscal framework. Uh, I'm quite optimistic for, for Russia in the next few years, and that I think is because you are now establishing the credibility of the inflation target. And uh, when we did that back in Sweden in, in 95, uh, the years after, what we saw was that inflation uh, became better and better anchored to to the target, and that meant that we year after year had inflation undershooting our, our forecasts at the central bank when I used to work there. And uh, that meant that interest rates came down and we had a period that was quite beneficial. And I do think that Russia is actually uh, just now in the juncture where the inflation target is becoming more and more credible. And I would, uh, my view would be that it's quite likely that you will see inflation undershooting forecasts. And therefore, I think uh, with your low valuation of the stock market, uh, uh, with the potential for a bond spread tightening, and, and also with uh, 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 obviously a potential strengthening of the ruble, I think the position in this juncture of the global economy is quite good for Russia. But I don't think we should be, be naive. The world is a difficult and harsh place. There is potential risk going forward. There is a deleverage process in China. The Eurozone, I think, remains unstable. Productivity in Italy has only been 0.3 over the last uh, five years. Uh, they have a fragile banking system. And if Sweden and Russia have strong public finances, this is not true for the rest of Europe. It is not true that they have strong banking systems. Uh, so I do think that there is a big risk that we will have financial turmoil coming back, Na not maybe in the next two or three years. But as an economist, we need also to look in a longer perspective. And if we take uh, a 10 year horizon, I think it's pretty clear that we will have financial turmoil, particularly in the Mediterranean countries coming back. And, and from my point of view, that means that you need to stick to this stringent macroeconomic framework that will provide you dry powder to use the next time you have a slowdown in the global economy. So don't change the framework. Stick to conservative fiscal policy and a tight monetary regime and keep your banks under hard pressure not to allow leverage to build up and keep tight requirements for capital. Now uh, lending is increasing in Russia. So I would strongly urge uh, 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 to see capital requirements go up over the next five to 10 years so that the banks remain strong also in the longer perspective. So don't change. My second point is simply change. So in Sweden, we have done a broad range of welfare reforms and I've spent a lot of time of those. That's what I did in the 90s and also when we restructured early retirement, pension system, sickness benefits and unemployment in, in the period when I was a finance minister. Uh, I do think that the issue for Russia is pensions. 
In Russia, the uh, employment rate between 55 and 65 is only, let me check the OECD number, 49.4%. In Sweden, the equivalent number is 77%. It's pretty clear that if employment rates in Russia would go up to the Swedish level, that would have a huge impact on uh, uh, growth the coming years. I would estimate that we're talking about more than 10% increase of GDP level if you could have the same employment rate as we have. Uh, you have done a pension reform. Let me mention that in Sweden we are now uh, increasing the pension age to 67 years. Uh, I know that there has been a lot of criticism of the reform in Russia. I do think that it's the right direction to travel. Uh, the, the average uh, age is increasing and demographics has to be dealt with. But I would like to make a second point. Everybody in the economic community knows that Sweden did these pension reforms and that they had a big impact on employment rates. Uh, the second impact they had was that our capital market developed very strongly over the last 20, 30 years. Sweden are today one of the countries where pensioners have a lot of money saved and most of that is invested in equities. So on average, a pension system is equal to 50% of GDP in the OECD countries. In Russia, it's only in equal to uh, 4%. So uh, the Russian public is not involved in the stock market. They don't uh, invest in long-term equity uh, funds. And I do think that that would be a very important reform over the coming years. And the reason for this is that any large, broad equity ownership, ownership has to be built on good corporate governance. And if you look at the Russian economy, the potential to increase productivity by greater, better corporate governance, increased transparency when it comes to accounting, stronger governance when it comes to the board's control over the independent directors, uh, uh, to push the companies uh, to do a more shareholder-friendly policy in terms of efficient investments, higher dividends, efficient management where you can trust that the company is run for the greater public and the shareholders rather, for, rather than, than uh, the, the leadership of the companies is, would be a very beneficial. So in the World uh, Bank's uh, cost of doing business, Russia has moved down to the 28th place, which is a great achievement. But if you look at the areas where Russia is lagging behind, it is clearly on corporate governance, the lack of open border trading, the lack of property rights protections and the lack of sh uh, protection for minority shareholders are the three areas where you're lagging in the World Bank uh, cost of doing business uh, indicators. So a pension reform that would open up for maybe in a 10 to 20 year perspective to have much more common ownership of equity and a greater involvement in the stock market would be improving efficiency and pushing a much more dynamic uh, capital market that would also improve the productivity of, of the economy. So yes, I think the pension reform that you have done is great. You probably need to do more in that direction, but to develop an efficient capital market and a culture of ownership where people fe feel that they are both uh, shareholders and stakeholders in, in the Russian economic development would I think be a, a very, very important factor for improving productivity. And let's remember that uh, the long-term interest rate in Russia is probably going down towards 2%. And if the pensioners only have 2% return owning deposits and, and, and bonds, uh, their uh, pension life increase of assets would only be 50%. If they would instead in, in, in invest in equity with an 8% return or something like that over the long run, they were fivefold their assets. And this is very important because when the pensioners feels that they have a long-term perspective where they can rely on their pension plan, that provides a much better, stronger social foundation for society, which is normally something that also uh, prolongs people's willingness to take a long-term perspective on economic policy and, and development. So my, my, is, my, my kind of simple message is don't change the macroeconomic framework. Uh, I would argue that a surplus Keynesian approach is the best. Be active with fiscal and monetary policy, but do it from a position of strength. Never expect the world to treat you nicely. The world is harsh and countries like Sweden and Russia needs to be strong. And secondly, I do think that you need to change. You need to do more structural reforms, particularly on the pension side. And I would argue that this 
uh, building a stakeholder, shareholder uh, community where the pensioners can expect good return on their money, would improve both productivity and social co cohesion. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Вопрос к Джегожу Колодко. Thank you very much. My next question goes to Джегож Колодко. Sir, you were one of the architects of economic reforms in Poland, and you played a very important role in the ascension of Poland to OECD and the EU in 2004. And uh, Polish economy has been showing stellar growth rates for nearly 30 years. Your country is uh, considered one of European leaders in terms of rates of growth. And some economists are even talking about the economic miracle of Poland. As a businessman, I know that our operations, our practice in Poland is also growing very strong. And I'm very pleasantly surprised by the number of new opportunities and number of new projects that arise in Poland pretty much every day. What do you think are the reasons for this great growth in Polish economy and what were the decisions of the regulators that played a key role in that? To what extent do you think Poland will be able to sustain such high growth rates? Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. <coughs> Indeed, I've been four times Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, and the times much more challenging than um, the current years. But because we are here for a certain reason, I must stress that I did the privilege to know Yegor Gaidar in person, and by very strange incident, we were together attending the, the Vries lectures. We published jointly the book economics of transition in English in 1992. And I witnessed when President Yeltsin called him, asking him to join the government. We were working at Erasmus University in, in the Netherlands when the call came. So Yegor joined the government. How he, why he failed and I succeeded, because that is the fact. I think that first things first, uh, the difference between Poland and Russia is that since the beginning of the so-called post-communist transition, say after the political break in 1989, I was also at the round table, we in Poland, disregarding what position on the political specter was uh, occupied by the time, were committed to join the European Union. That gives, gave us a lot of freedom, but also it constrained it limited our institutional changes. We had to fill into a key community that is the regulation of the European Union. And from left to right, or from right to left, I'm leaving aside the extremes, there was a commitment to join the European Union. But that can be said about another dozen East Central European countries, and they were still not as successful as Poland was. Uh, secondly, I'm basically professor of economics all the time. I got my tenure in the late 80s, but my research, same as Gaidar, was policy-oriented. Always I've been asking how the things work, and if I believe that I knew a little bit how the things work, what to do to change the things for better. But to change for better, it implies the values. So economic policy is never void of values. The question is what we would like to accomplish, and this is also the question towards contemporary Russia, Poland, or US, or China, or whatever. So we are already in beyond the GDP economies. And one must be aware of the fact that beyond GDP economies calls for beyond GDP economic theory and beyond GDP uh, economic policy and development strategy. The level of GDP, the pace of growth of GDP, the return on the capital, on the investment, it's not everything. We have to be care about social cohesion and about ecological balance. So that is what I'm, where I'm coming with my new pragmatism theory, which I tried to implement in the case of Poland. Why we have succeeded a little bit more, uh, or if compared, say, to Matyushka, Russia, or to Ukraine, a lot of better than uh, Russia. Um, I think that first, that all the time we were concerned about macroeconomic stabilization, but also capital saving and capital formation. And then 
having growing savings about uh, efficient capital allocation through two major channels. That is the well-designed, uh, supervised, and governed capital market on the one hand and banking sector on the other hand. We did not have oligarchs. We don't have them, as you have in Russia. We didn't have corruption privatization. We didn't have the scandals on our mar capital market. Well, some of them, but nothing like in Czech Republic or in Serbia or in Ukraine or in Russia, etc. It was firmly under the leadership government uh, control, and there were never a single oligarch uh, close to the government, and uh, not even in the uh, government. So the banking sector and the capital mar market were taken care of, and they supported the capital formation and efficient competitive capital allocation. Secondly, we were opened for support of the national savings, which were not sufficient, and they are still not sufficient, uh, from f direct from foreign investment, especially the direct one. They have let helped us a lot to diversify the real economy and to upgrade the technological competitive edge and the managerial skills. So for that reason, the foreign savings, which were supporting our domestic savings, they help us also to restructure the real economy and to make it more competitive at the time of the opening of the, uh, of the uh, market. So I think that these are the very basic um, recipes for relative um, success. This is true that we did not have a recession for the single quarter since mid of 1992, which is the world record together with Australia. And our growth is remarkable, but there are still very many problems, somehow familiar to the problems we have now in Russia. First, this is the same mistake which you are committing in Russia. This is with cutting or not raising the retirement age. Here, it's a very severe mistake. The most severe mistake of the current government is the reversing the trend in raising the retirement age. Because the society is aging and the dependency ratio is deteriorating and in the longer run, the public finance system is not up to change the, uh, the uh, challenge. Second biggest mistake in my view is that Poland is not joining the common currency zone of Euro Maybe my Swedish colleague has a different opinion because we are, we are in a similar position as Sweden. We have the right and the obligation to join the euro under the treaty of membership, unlike Denmark, which, ha which has the right to stay out. Now, when Britain is leaving, only Denmark is the only country which may stay outside the euro being the member of the European Union. Each other member, including the most recent one, Croatia, they have the obligation by the treaty, so we don't uh, utilize our right and we don't follow the obligation. Um, that is the policy of the current <coughs> government, but it's disputable also within the economic, um, uh, within the economic um, uh, circles. Our problem also currently, similar like in Russia or maybe even bigger than in Russia, is a relatively low uh, <coughs> national saving uh, ratio. And my experience, I listened carefully what President Putin yesterday said, all this project of uh, maternal, maternal capital support for families will not work. You will spend a lot of money and you will not see raising the fertility rate because of that program. It's a good program from the social viewpoint, but it is not performing and it won't be performing from the uh, demographic viewpoint. For that reason that the people, the families will get more money, there will be no children. There will be only more children if, the, if there will be the cultural shift. It's a very much the empowering the women. And the money is supposed not to go to the pockets of the families, but the money is supposed to go to support free, ch free school, take uh, free, if you wish, free as under communism, you know, or socialism, access to good quality of kindergarten and early children care to empower the women to work, and then they will be not afraid that they will get rid of the labor market <coughs> and so on. As for the world economy, 
In the long run, I'm positive. In the short run, I'm negative. Very much depends who will be uh, swear uh, as the next president in one year time in White House. Hopefully, it will be not Donald Trump, which is the biggest threat for the world economy and the world stability. Uh, I put some trust in uh, China. I'm not naive to by what China's leaders are saying about win-win globalization. Sometimes I'm joking that win-win globalization uh, in Chinese way means 2 zero for China, not inclusive globalization, but globalization is irreversible process. Poland is a <coughs> medium country. Sweden is a small country. Russia is big country. China is huge country. There is not anybody who is, can compete with China as far as taking globalization to development advantage is concerned. China is a master is in taking a, a globalization for the China's development and contrary to Russia, which is absolutely not to the challenge. You have wasted three decades of recent globalization. You have not shown in Russia your ability to take globalization into, uh, into advantage. So now looking forward to the future, I think that the first uh, things for Russia is to diversify the real structure of the economy. You cannot depend, you know, all the time on vodka and Kalashnikov and oil, uh, you know, oil and gas and military equipment if you want to play the global economic game. And uh, when uh, Soviet Union did collapse three decades ago, Russia's GDP, Soviet Russia, not Soviet Union, Soviet Russia GDP was three times bigger than China's. Now Chinese GDP is six times bigger than, uh, than Russia. And that is very much because of uh, ability in the case of China and disability in case of Russia of playing the global economic game. So we are, Poland as the medium open economy, we are taking globalization to our extent, not in the best possible way because we should have much better economic relations with Russia and because of the political reasons they are not as good as they're supposed to be. We don't have also uh, good enough relations with China, but that's our problem, not the problem of the world economy. In the longer run, the trade war will be won by China. China will win because China is already by 25% bigger on purchasing power parity economy than uh, US uh, and China is 1.4 billion people almost. Soon India will be the more populous country. And uh, China has the ability, do you like it or not, and also because of the Chinese political and economic system to which I refer in my newest book as Chinism. It's neither capitalism or socialism. It's a different system. This is Chinism. It's an, another animal. They have the ability as anybody else not definitely American administration and Western leaders, not definitely Polish leaders, and I'm, I'm afraid also not in Russia, we'll see. Maybe new government will come with something new, yet I'm not sure about that. To have the long shot uh, approach, how to change the things in the very long uh, run. And from this perspective, all my thinking about the future is within the framework of globalization. So what is globalization? From economic perspective, globalization is liberalization and integration of thus far to the extent separately performing national economies into one interconnected, interdependent global economy. What happens here? Here can be Sweden, Russia, Poland, China, or whatever. Depends upon what has happened elsewhere and is making an influence also in other parts of interconnected world. So the question is how to take advantage of the global exchange of know-how, technology, managerial skills, trade, flow of capital, portfolio, direct investments, and of course there is also geoeconomics and geopolitics, which is very different in country like Poland and a country like, uh, like Russia. I'm not sure that we are taking, I mean now we in Poland advantage of our geopolitical position. By far not, because we have very bad relations with our eastern neighbors, starting from Russia. What good policy it is. This is very bad policy. So the biggest concern for my country, for Poland, now is not an economic matter. I'm very proud of Polish economy. I'm very proud of Polish culture. I'm very ashamed of Polish politics. What's going on now in Poland, the Polish domestic civil war between the right-wing post-solidarity party, which is now in charge of the government, and the left-wing uh, or central uh, post-solidarity party, which was in the previous government, is a uh, waste of time and energy. 
instead of focusing on meeting the structural challenges to sustain the post-GDP post development, social, economic, and ecological, they are fighting on, on a minor, well, maybe not minor, but say on political issues, there is much more <coughs> discussion about the history than about the future, which is not good for the economy. But part of the success, my last point, and I think that here we have to learn from each other. Maybe we can learn also a little bit from Russia, but definitely Russia can learn much more from our experience. This is the microeconomic uh, management. I think that, you know, the piece of the success is not policymakers, us. Well, we can take a credit to the extent. It was not easy to bring country to the OECD or to negotiate the terms to join the European Union and to run Poland uh, with 8% rate of growth war at the same time bringing inflation down and unemployment up. But it's very much about uh, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurship uh, and uh, management. It means, it means a lot. And when I listened yesterday to President Putin, he was speaking like the prime minister. He was speaking like the chief economist of the country. Is that the role of the president of the country? I think that there is still too much of statism, government intervention into the Russian economy, and there should be a little bit more of deregulation and liberalization. But be careful. Never do what, to some extent, Yegor was trying to do. Don't become too much neoliberal, because the, the recipe for success, to the limited extent Polish, to the great extent China, is a proper synergy, a proper synergy, which was not accomplished so far in Russia, between the power of invisible hand of market and the power of the visible hand of the government. If one of these two powers is too strong, that implies the other one is too weak, you are not bound for success. And that's the story which I would like to share with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a follow-up question. China and the U.S. signed the uh, treaty that within the next two years China would import uh, worth 200 billion worth of uh, products. So they're trying to resolve this uh, trade war between uh, the U.S. and China. What would be the ultimate outcome of this uh, showdown between uh, China and the U.S.? And my second follow-up question is that there are ways to move away from the U.S. dollar as a key currency in transactions. Are there any prospects here? Uh, no, the dollar will remain the world currency, the major currency in the foreseeable future, say for next uh, two, three, one, two, three decades, even till mid 50s, 50s. Uh, with relatively weaker power, euro will get the momentum again. Now, euro is only 23% of the global currency reserves, so dollar is 61. And gradually, very gradually, slowly, not any shocks and surprise. RMB, yuan, yuan, the Chinese currency, will be getting growing share. Now it is just 1.1%, but not in the foreseeable future. We are young and healthy. We see even, you know, the end of the century, uh, China's currency will take over a uh, dollar. It is not in any, uh, in any uh, scenario. But relatively, the significance, the meaning of the dollar will be on the decline, and a little bit more momentum will be also mm, taken by Chinese mm, currency. As for the trade war, China will win. China will win because China has a rational macroeconomic policy, which is done under the authoritarian regime, which we don't like because of our political correctness. But the Chinese system does work. And what China has signed, Prime Minister Li, and, uh, yesterday in Wash uh, two days ago, no, yesterday in Washington, um, it's a compromise, of course. China has given a little bit because they know who is in the White House. They don't want the trade war with unaccountable, irresponsible, economic ignorant, who is the economic, who is the president of the United States. So they are giving a little bit to the U.S. To, to calm the tensions. And in the longer run, China will restructure. In Africa, 20 years ago, there was one billion people. 
Now there is 1.3 billion people. In 30 years, there will be 2.5 billion people, and China will be the biggest investor and the biggest trader partner, and China will take over Africa in the sense of economic dominance. China will not colonize Africa. China is not an imperialist country, but China is playing the global economic game. And China is taking this pressure imposed from, by US to restructure also the foreign trade. They are trying to get access to alternative markets instead to the American market to diversify their export markets and so on. And so on. on the other hand, well, they are buying more of Chinese uh, goods, which is, of course, good for American uh, tr Trump uh, re-election uh, attempt, because definitely he would, uh, he would uh, run. It will change a little bit uh, China structure, but now if you jump to America and you will take a look at what's going on, United States trade balance is much more in deficit now, after three years of Trumponomics, than it was when he started all this exercise. But now there is the big deficit of, China, of US with Mexico, with Brazil, with European Union, and with other countries. So rebalancing, you know, the US-China trade by trade war uh, in Mr. Trump way is not working on the behalf of the United States. So th therefore, uh, I think that, well, of course, I'm very much against the trade war. I think it's very stupid, it's very short-sighted, and it is very dangerous for the world economy. It is not good for most of us, including the American business, which will be uh, making a great pressure for Trumponomics to change the course because it is not good for American business and it is not good for American American uh, consumers, but for some countries it is good. For instance, Bangladesh or Vietnam has get a little bit of momentum because some import to US has shifted from China to this so other uh, other markets. Thank you. Спасибо, Anders Erikborg, пожалуйста. Yes, let me just follow up what the, on the comments from my, my Polish friend. Um, first of all, I, I agree on the point made on preschooling. So my mother-in-law grew up here in Russia. She's a Russian mathematician. Uh, and she has been preaching for me always that preschooling in the 50s and the school system in the 50s was very good in terms of uh, STEM education, particularly mathematics. And here, I think it's an important point. We have the highest maternity rates in Europe in the Nordic area and the highest labor force participation among women. Why is that? Well, it is because we provide high quality, low cost or no cost preschooling from one year's age. And this means that women uh, can work and also have a good family life. So the balance between work and family and gender equality uh, uh, makes women uh, willing to have children even if they are well educated and live in, in urban areas. And that's the only way, uh, because in uh, countries that are developed, it's the woman that, who decides whether there will be one, two, or three children. And in only if you have gender equality, good preschooling, and a work-life balance that works for women, you will have higher uh, uh, maternity rates. Uh, secondly, I, I disagree. Poland will never join the euro. Uh, Poland and Sweden are two equal-sized economies, so the cost for Poland to join only to uh, take care of the banking union side would be equal to almost 5% in, in, of GDP. Uh, it is very difficult to see why the Polish people would be willing to pay for Italian, Greek, and Portuguese banks. Uh, so no developed country that are not heading towards a crisis will now join the euro. And the legal treaties are very clear. I worked for the Riksbank when we did the assessment of this back in when we had a referendum, as long as the le you, you don't legally have uh, obliged yourself to join the jury, your legislative is not in concurrent with the legislation, because as long as the Slotty and the Krona is the uh, uh, legal tender, you are cannot join the euro. So it will always be a decision for the country whether they will join or not. And given that the eurozone is so unstable, and we talked about banking crisis. So the banking union has provided a very strange structure where good banks will be ba bad banks will be bailed in, and that will have systemic impact on the stability of the banking system. Uh, and therefore, the system is unstable. The banking union, in combination with low productivity, makes the euro system unstable and crisis prone. And therefore, a flexible exchange rate is a good buffer for both Sweden and 
and, and Poland. Um, so be a member of the EU, be a part of the economic system, uh, but stay out of the euro because it will be very costly for a country uh, uh, like Poland uh, 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 to, to join. Thank you so much. So let's now switch gears and talk about Russia. I have a question to Mr. Drabyshevsky. Recently you said that the national projects, that they were, the way they were launched in, back in 2018, cannot uh, kickstart uh, economic growth. Not strong enough. And uh, as we saw yesterday, some in our state agree with your vision. So what are the, the best ways to resolve the issues? And what about uh, the consensus price uh, on oil? Will it uh, help us uh, to uh, address the challenges that we're facing? As I recently said in an interview to uh, some of the Russian media, actually, you a little bit tweak you tweaked a little bit uh, the way mm, I presented it. Our assessment uh, confirms uh, earlier research, and according to it, even if all the national projects uh, are executed, if their contribution to GDP would be quite modest. The National Economy Institute, our, our assessment says it would be just about a five to seven percentage points of growth a year. So if we look at existing growth, if we look at the structural growth, given the current capacity, given the current productivity, that's uh, a, a pace of growth that uh, would be lower than what our president uh, wants, uh, and that's not 3 3.5. It's within 2 or a maximum 2.5 percent a year. So that's below the global average. So as we see it, national project is a tool of economic policy, but it would be naive to believe that national projects alone would allow Russia to go back to, to go to the top five national, to go to top five of the global economies and uh, to uh, move to a sustainable economic growth model. But there's a second component to it. National projects are a kind of a signal. Back in 2018, according to a decree by the president following the debates among economists, the president and the government picked a model for the next six years that relies on the leading role of the state. And the national projects, state-run companies, these are the drivers of economic growth that are supposed to push the economy forward. Now, how will the economy develop? As the national projects are implemented, as uh, new projects are implemented by state-run companies or by the governments, the private sector is supposed to join the implementation of the projects. We'll see new niches internally, domestically, and uh, externally. The private sector is supposed to invest into these projects, uh, and that would help them grow. Now, we with all those uh, conditions in place, uh, the desirable pace would be 3, 3.5, or in 4 percent, and that is uh, feasible. Definitely uh, 
there's no 100% guarantee that we'll have it, but given the previous track record, so uh, given the uh, uh, other cases in the economy, given the capacity, given the uh, potential in boosting our labor productivity, it's quite feasible. However, the past 18 months have convinced us and the government, given the, uh, given the decision yesterday, that uh, that's been time wasted. Up until recently, the national projects have not contributed directly to GDP, even if, mod if, modest, if, uh, if it's a modest contribution. And remember the debates we had between uh, Arashkin, Kudrin, and Sulianov uh, at uh, VTB forum on the uh, current uh, execution of the project. And again, we don't see any other signs that uh, the projects have been successful. The government laid out uh, an action plan to move the economy to a new trajectory, to a new path. The government is supposed to provide the right kind of environment for the private business to develop. Structural reforms are a separate issue. We've been talking about that for a long time, and some have grown weary about that. And uh, we have had an active debate uh, ever since 2010. We talked about it as part of the 2020 strategy. And by the third presidential term of President, of President Putin, uh, we uh, are seeing that there have been high hopes by the business community, but this is not happening. So in that sense, we're still in a situation where the national projects, if implemented in the same scale as they were initially designed, have a chance to make a small contribution to GDP. and help to develop the economy in general in the remaining four years. Now, as for externalities, as for the oil price, whether they can help us or uh, set us back, given the current circumstances, Well, prices are a uh, sort of a, have been put on the back burner. It's a secondary factor in terms of its importance. Whether we want it or not, the Russian economy has moved away from its dependence on oil prices. And uh, to a large extent, it happened in a natural way, not because of the any efforts by the government. The Russian economy is no more uh, directly depend, uh, dependent on oil prices. And it's not just uh, down to the fiscal rule that's usually, uh, exp that's usually uh, used as an explanation by the central bank or the government. It's all down to uncontrolled natural processes that uh, are happening in the real sector might be not as conspicuous. However, since 2005, 2007, maybe, hydrocarbons output reached a certain plateau, uh, reached a certain stable level, and it's remained flat ever since. And we had high growth 2009-2013. And these growth rates of the non-hydrocarbon sector 
So actually, what we're seeing is that uh, non-hydrocarbon sector has been growing very fast, and that's been uh, outpacing the hydrocarbon sector. So w the growth of 1 uh, to 1.5 percent, this is the growth in the non-hydrocarbon sector. That's a modest growth, but still, it's growth. So we've had these non-hydrocarbon sector growth for the past 10 years, at least in the case of uh, GDP. There are other challenges for the budget. There is a different structure. But if we talk about GDP, the oil and sector, the oil and gas sector contribution is shrinking. And so our GDP is growing because of uh, consumer spending, budget spending, because of consumer lending, because the private sector can invest in its products, and not just to, due to the transfers, uh, due to the exports of our uh, natural resources. Following the oil price collapse in the 2014, Russia has adapted, adapted to the current uh, band in oil prices between 40 to 60 US dollars. And if the oil price stays there, our economy will not, well, given there wouldn't be any uh, sharks, it might be plus 10, 15 percent, uh, plus or minus. Currently, it's about 60 US dollars, but th that's not what we used to have, uh, like uh, 120. So price cannot fall $60 below, because otherwise it would be zero. So the economy overall has adapted, has adjusted to these oil prices. And with little volatility, growth is taking place uh, in a natural way. And what the government should do is just to add extra demand, extra incentives through fiscal ways, less monetary, so that there is uh, bigger demand and the non-hydrocarbon economy could adjust to it and grow at a higher pace than 1 or 1.5 percent. Thank you. Well, I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, Alex say. The World Bank indicated that the global economy was 2.4 percent last year. Everyone said uh, we had 1.2 percent. There are varying estimates. Developing countries post 3.5 percent. So we are significantly lagging behind. So we are threefold behind. Uh, developed economies, what are our in internal or external drivers that can help us to catch up? It also said that the surplus uh, in our budget, uh, given the stagnating economy, is not n normal. On the, one, on the other hand, you say that uh, there are prospects of growth. What does your research say? Is it because of the private uh, investment, or do you only pin hopes on the budget, uh, but on a, perhaps a more efficient allocation of these budget resources? Good afternoon. Well, first of all, the horizons of economic policy in Russia are defined by the State of the Union address by the President. And you might remember the 2015 address when he said there's midterm midterm uh, projection to grow uh, above uh, the uh, global average and the uh, government uh, had a target scenario where they would improve the business climate uh, um, st war private investments uh, provide financing for uh, the uh, uh, SMEs but something went wrong, and the growth was uh, 
very poor. In 2017, we had decree number 204 by the president that said that Russia would become top five, the global economies, but these are softer conditions because average growth uh, for the next five years would be 2.5 percent. But in order, and in order to remain the sixth and uh, still be ahead of Indonesia, we need to have 1.9. So we had a reset uh, in terms of the scenarios, and the go and public investment was supposed to lead, and national projects uh, would be the prevalent form of investment. This is a riskier option, actually. 70% of all investment in fixed assets are actually come from the private sector, and 15% that budget uh, investment. And there are also natural monopolies uh, who take up the rest. So such a huge contribution of the public sector investment activity is a major systemic risk as I see it. And so 2019, despite the fact that the Ministry of Economic Development said that uh, we, uh, we had a lot of subsidies, well, it was actually a poor one. And there are two projections uh, that is done by the ministry in April and in September. April said there will be 1.7 in 2019, but in September they said it would be 1.3, so the downgrade is uh, their forecast. And the non-hydrocarbon exports in April was uh, six-point growth, and in September it was minus 3%. So economic incentives didn't work. The investment activity was uh, extremely low. And it's, an, it's September projection says that the key sources of key drivers of stagnation is the, the tight monetary policy and an extremely tight fiscal policy. So the leading role of the state, coupled with uh, the tight uh, economic policy, brought about a uh, stagnation in our, the, in our economy. So the central bank responded that it does not believe in QE, uh, quantitative easing, and our financial markets are not ready for this. So it urged the government to embark on structural reforms. And we're now in a sort of a dead end and a stalemate. The national projects uh, are underfinanced, the economy is not growing, and so uh, the fiscal policy is quite tight. At the same, ha well, at the same time, investment is flat. There are more threats, however, that stagnation in investment uh, would mean stagnation in general. So, according to the uh, 2008 uh, SN. Uh, SNA, uh, you know, the key driver is machinery and equipment, but that's not been growing since 2013. And we only have some increase might be in military spending. And the Russian economy is uh, getting increasingly inefficient. Like the seventh uh, law of socialism used to say that labor productivity had to be higher than real wages. In 2013, real wages were growing twice as fast as labor productivity. In 2018, it was growing eight times faster. So I'm sure this situation will persist this year. So the economy is getting inefficient and labor costs are growing. And that prevents Russia from reaching a hitting a sustainable economic growth trajectory. So the high share of the state is an issue. It's high everywhere, and that's the key challenge. So what has to be done in 2020? What's inevitable is a reset of the economic policy. First and foremost, we need to rebalance, recalibrate the fiscal and the monetary policy. As I said multiple times, Russia is the only country in the world that is in stagnation 
show economic growth at the level of um, la margin of error and the surplus uh, uh, would be about 1.5 percent. So the the government is taking more from uh, the government is taking more from the economy that it gives. So we have two economic parties: the party of stability and the party of economic growth. Strange as it may seem, there's been a paradox, a kind of a, a paradox here. So stability at the say at the expense of economic growth, that's a pretty strange uh, policy. As for the exchange rates, we are seeing a dangerous game. This is a weak ruble game. So they some say that a weak weak ruble is bad is good for the economy. That's false. So we have two groups of economic agents, two group of uh, stakeholders. Some like the weak ruble and some don't like the weak ruble. So 30% of the Russian imports, that's investment. So weakening ruble is something that you have to subtract from the investment. Inflation targeting, as uh, we mentioned here, actually that's modifies uh, IT. The central bank does target uh, IT, does target inflation. But uh, the finance ministry targets the exchange rate using the fiscal rule. S 7 billion rubles w left the Russian economy, and that weakened the, uh, the ruble. But uh, the finance ministry purchased 70, oh, sorry, 70 billion US dollars, uh, so 10 times more than left the country. So that's a dangerous game. So the free float of the exchange of the national currency. Well, that's only a one, one way. So it won't go to 40 rubles per one US dollars, but it, could, it can go upward to 200 uh, rubles per US dollar. So with such expectations, it's hard to talk about any hopes for uh, an uptick in economic activity. So last year we talked about a lot about uh, consumer lending, and that's an issue that we need to resolve. I don't believe in the projection by the Ministry of Economic Development that next year consumer loans would grow 4%. I would rather side with the central bank that it would be 14 or 15% growth, but that machine where we have short-term loans, but very expensive, like $2 trillion a year, that's uh, the amounts that the population pays in interest. We have to somehow slow it down. And we also need to stabilize the tax regime. We always have, you know, so leaks saying that uh, the, uh, uh, that the uh, income uh, tax would grow, personal income tax would grow. So, and also, in so proprietors, entrepreneurs need to be sure that there will be stable tax rates in the near term. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, because the, the topic for our panel is Gorizonte Economicisca Politiki, I think we have simply to, lo to look uh, beyond horizon. You ask also about the China. It's a long shot. There are the things, is it Russia or China or US or Nigeria, Brazil, you name it, said Indonesia, which you cannot solve by manipulating interest rate, exchange rate, tax rate. It is much more important and much more complex than that. When I said what I'm addressing in my new, the uh, new pragmatism theory, we are in beyond GDP economics. And I don't, I'm, I'm I don't like to listen all the time about rate of growth of GDP and the level of GDP per capita because it is misleading. I haven't heard that much yesterday in yesterday's speech of Mr. Putin about inequality. Inequality in Russia is unsustainable. Inequality in Russia acts against development. You are losing the competitive edge because you have too big inequality. So it must be addressed. It is, a, it is more important even than the general or average GDP growth because the question is how the income 
this possible income of the household will be growing for different groups of social strata. It's also the very much problem of US and China with the different systems because they have also unsustainable inequality. I haven't heard that much about natural environment. Russia is in Syria, successful. Russia is supporting Hafar in Libya. Now, uh, problems with Turkey, which is uh, in favor of the counterpart, the Tripoli government. But I haven't heard about Russia during the recent climate summit. And if you want to get the hearts and minds of the next generation, you have to take care of the protection of the natural environment. And Russia is the biggest country in the world. I've been even to Kamchatka and Chukotka, and I know what Russia is about, you know. Most of you, you haven't been, you know, even to Siberia. It's a big country. And Russia is very much influential from this viewpoint, and Russia is completely void from the global debate. And we are talking about, you know, development. So my new pragmatism is an outline of an orthodox economic theory which is aiming to triple dynamic balance between economic development, but on the one hand social, including social cohesion, economic inequality, human and social capital, and on the other hand, ecological balance. <coughs> we know a lot about uh, alternative measures of social and socioeconomic development than GDP. At least inequality adjustment human development index should be brought to the fore and if we compare the countries along, for instance, this criterion, human development index, inequality adjusted human development index, a well-being, a prosperity index, Russia is relatively doing better than if we compared Russia with other countries without GDP. Forget about stupid idea to be the fifth largest economy in the world in terms of GDP. Try to advance more in, say, uh, better life index. It is much more important. And then you will see the fields which are beyond GDP. And then you will address the challenges, the economic horizons, you will see in a different way. And that was also a little bit of my recipe in Poland, which was very difficult to do because on the one hand, I had the neoliberal opposition, and on the other hand, the new nationalism, uh, populistic opposition. So now I have two enemies. Enemy of my enemy is not my friend. Enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Neoliberalism is my enemy because it is working on enriching the few at the cost of many. And new nationalism is my enemy because I am very much in, against, you know, uh, nationalism and populism and in favor of inclusive globalization, where I, I believe Russia in the long run may play, should play uh, a more important, more important uh, role. So for that reason, I hope that maybe not in next speech by Mr. President, but in next uh, Guy Darowski Economic Risky Forum, we can discuss a little bit more alternative measure of social economic development, where I think Russia can accomplish much more while competing with some other countries. So Maurice, Sir? Uh, kind of a white elephant here that we also need to talk about. Uh, FDIs in Russia uh, pre-2014 was around 50 billion euros per year. It's now around 20. Uh, the, the great reduction of FDIs in, in Russia is basically Europe. So Europe's uh, FDIs in Russia has gone down, according to the World Bank, with 88%. So it's basically gone down 90%. There are basically two regions that invest in Russia, and that is Germany and the Nordics. Uh, the Nordic economics are eco economies in dollar terms are equal size of, of Russia, and, and Ger Germany is twice that size. And if you look at FDIs, it's always been the Nor 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 Nordic countries and the Germans that has been willing to provide technology and long-term uh, investments in, in Russia. Uh, I strongly believe that Russia has a, a, a European future, and I agree with my Polish friend here, uh, realigning Russia uh, as a European country with strong ties to its neighbor, particularly the Nordics and, and Germany, I think is crucial. It's pretty clear that those are, there are two requirements for that to happen. One is uh, the same uh, arguments that I raised about uh, capital markets. Uh, governance issues in the corporates, uh, uh, transparency when it comes to accounting, and so forth. But then it's also these uh, issues in foreign policy, 
where in the longer run, I think we are uh, also given the meeting with Merkel and Putin and the progress that are now being done with Ukraine, probably moving in the right direction. But that's the, if you really want to kickstart uh, the Russian economy, uh, solving the issues with uh, 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 Ukraine, realigning with Europe would probably the, be the fastest way to increase investments in the business sector, because that would bring the, the Nordics and, and Germany back as a key economic partner. And those type of FDIs would also bring modern technology. And one could talk about China, but in economic terms, China is not close to Russia, because Russia economy is St. Petersburg and Moscow and the European side of Russia. And if you want to have a, a modern growth built on urbanization, knowledge society and technology, it is uh, from the Nordics and from, from Germany that technology and those investments can come. So I would strongly argue that, that uh, to kickstart Russian economy, a realignment uh, with Europe is the, 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 the way forward. I'm, I'm just reading the book Lost Kingdom about the Greek Orthodox Russian church. And it's pretty clear that uh, uh, you can't even talk about Russian culture without mentioning the dimension that the whole culture is built around the notion of the, the European uh, idea world coming from, obviously, Rome and Constantinople. So Russian history has always been European, and it, uh, the Russian future should also be European. And I think we should do our best to try to realign our interests uh, in that respect again. Thank you very much, sir. This is proving to be a very interesting discussion, however. I've been asked to save like 10 minutes for questions from the room. So we have roughly 10 minutes for the Q&A session. It would be a shame not to entertain questions to our stellar speakers. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Don't forget to introduce yourself. And please, let's stick to questions. I hope everybody understands the difference between questions and comments. Hi, Lundberg. I'm Swedish, working in Russia for many years. and. Uh, I would just like to make a short comment to Mr. Kolodko. I, I fully agree with your uh, position that there should be less uh, intervention from above and more support uh, to small business in Russia. But I would like to address a, a special question to uh, Anders Borg, uh, because Sweden has a very specific law, uh, the, the law of uh, security of employment, the laws. Uh, and which basically makes it impossible for an employer to uh, set off uh, an employee. It, the, it, at least he has to have very serious reasons for that. In Russia, uh, I can fire my people in two weeks' time. What is your opinion on the future of loss of this law in Sweden? And what is the position of your party, the Conservative Party, in this issue? Thank you. Well, uh, without making it into a Swedish uh, discussion, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that Russia should have a flexible employment legislation, because the only way you can attract manufacturing industry to come here and produce is by also having quite liberal rules for hiring and firing. And uh, uh, that, I think, is, is a kind of a prerequisite that you then move to something like a more of a social stable model with slightly better uh, social security system, so people accept more than uh, uh, the fact that they might get fired from j one job and then you have active uh, employment policies to, to get them into a new job. So I think flex security is a, a way forward also for Russia. So flexible employment protection, but then safety within transition. Let me comment on that as well. We had a session yesterday called Economy of Trust. I was approached by Russian businessmen prior to the start of the session uh, who told me, you know what, I really envy those Americans who can fire people on the spot. But here I'm happy to learn that we have a more liberal system compared to Sweden. More questions, please. Hello. Uh, my question goes to Sergei and Alexei. Or maybe if others want to answer, that's perfectly fine. So uh, would you think uh, that uh, presidential address yesterday um, that uh, obviously called for extra spending and Mr. Kudrin estimated to be like four or 500 billion rubles, 
combined with this uh, reshuffle of the government. Uh, you probably know that Mr. Medvedev has been the prime minister for eight years. So do you think it is going to provide for some rejuvenation effect? What's your name? I'm Timothy. I'm sorry, anything else uh, we need to know about you, Timothy? You know, I'm, I'm still a student. Okay, I'm just wondering. You know, when we are discussing major macroeconomic factors, and indeed, Mr. Goodwin said it was going to cost the country some like two trillion rubles in the course of four years. Now, this is not a huge amount of money for the Russian budget. I mean, we can find this sort of money in the Russian budget. It was indeed presented uh, by the president as a, a response to demographic issues. But I actually think that demographic impact will be marginal, and the major impact of uh, this initiative will be that it's going to slightly shift wealth towards the less advantaged social strata. And that may also help support consumption. We do understand that this country needs to increase spending on uh, social matters, you know, health, education, stuff like this. There was uh, uh, this discussion recently at uh, the level of State Duma about uh, potential increase of personal income tax for uh, the more privileged people, uh, while at the same time decreasing personal income taxes or giving PIT subsidies to the more disadvantaged people. Indeed, uh, we have millions of people who have uh, disposable incomes or total incomes uh, slightly above the poverty level or slightly below the poverty level. So this is a matter that needs to be addressed. But what was also advertised by the president was uh, this idea of raising actual uh, incomes to the level of uh, the level at least comparable, at least on par, with a minimum. It's not a minimum wage. Oh, okay, let's call it minimum wage. That alone will cost the state some like 800 billion rubles per year. And I personally think uh, that would be a much better way of spending money compared, for example, to Keynesian measures like building infrastructure or even national projects. And that is actually going to do a lot in terms of improving lives of millions of people. Yeah, I also wanted to add that uh, three trillions, well, that's like a three percent of the budget, and uh, we currently have this money, so no doubt about that. I actually see no point in keeping putting money in the piggy bank. After all, we'll never have enough money for the rainy day. And rather than saving money for the rainy day, we should make sure the rainy day never comes. I'm a Usem Chichin. I'm an author of a book called Escaping the Crisis. My question will go to all the experts, really. So do you think that um, a high key rate by the central bank, uh, which effectively makes uh, corporate loans uh, almost inaccessible, do you think it's uh, dampening economic growth? And do you think that uh, if the central bank drops its interest rate to zero, it will expedite growth? And do you think we can actually issue loans to people who have economic degrees at 2%? Thank you. No, I don't think this way. I am a, a devout opponent of uh, this theory of flooding the economy with money. I think we have been discussing issues like this for a long time. 
And I, I don't think it's a good idea to put that kind of risk on the central bank. And uh, recent empirical studies covering 120 countries around the world show that there is apparently a negative link between uh, I'm sorry, uh, he says between GDP growth and economy growth, but obviously he must mean, oh, right, so it was between a level of uh, like a ratio between uh, total loans to GDP. So there is an inflection point around 65%. Below that level, there is a positive correlation. Above that level, it changes to the inverse. So I, I was at the VTB conference listening to President Putin when he gave a lot of praise to, to the central bank. And I, I think he's absolutely right in supporting the independence of, of Russian central bank. Because uh, the policy rate is not the key rate for the economy. The key rate is the whole yield curve and obviously also the credit spreads that we have for corporates. That's the relevant vector of interest rates for, for business investment. And the only way to bring those interest rates down is to have a credible central bank and inflation expectations that are well anchored to the inflation target. And to my view, this is it's going to happen now in 2020, 2021 in Russia, that you have a tough central bank and that will imply that long yield will come down substantially and also that credit spreads for corporates will go down. So I think the least problem for the Russian economy for the next three to five years is high interest rates. We are in an interest rate convergence for, for Russia. I, I spoke to some hedge, US hedge funds yesterday and this is one of their conclusions out of, of the changes now in, in the political scene that the bond convergence trade in, in Russia is one of the, the, the favorite trades now from, from the markets. So uh, I don't think that the central bank should cut policy rate dramatically because that would undermine credibility. If they cut them gradually and uphold the inflation target, all the other interest rates will fall dramatically and that would provide a good stimulus for the economy while maintaining stability. It is very strange maybe to hear from the finance ministers uh, support for independence of the central bank. Central bank must be independent from the government presuming that the governance of the central bank is a professional one, which happens from time to time. And I think it is the case of now Russia, but not necessarily when I was in office in Poland. So I did have plenty of problems with uh, uncompetent governance of the central bank, which was too independent and responsible only to the God in history, and they didn't believe to neither. Uh, definitely, uh, it would be adventurism to bring the interest rate down to zero, but uh, there is the room to decrease uh, step by step gradually um, the interest rate. I think that the problem of traditional growth in uh, Russia and search for an instrument to accelerate is, mm, is somehow linked to the existing capacity. The problem is first how to enable the business to sell what they are able to produce to deliver to the market without investment, which is to be co-financed by the banking credit. And that depends on the effective demand. So let's bring all the things together because one of the recipe for my success was complexity in economic policy, not just looking from this or that perspective. And I think that the shift declared yesterday by president of Russia, Mr. Putin, to take care of uh, the families, especially with the, uh, many children, and to raise a minimum income, maybe even the minimum salary, will contribute to faster growing income of the uh, relatively uh, uh, lagging behind households, which will fuel the business <coughs> ability to expand on the one hand before they will invest because they still may use existing capacity and at the same time will contribute to the climbing inequality, which in the long run will be facilitating economic growth in traditional way and in the new pragmatism way. And uh, I would encourage Russia president and whoever is prime minister, I know who was yesterday in the morning prime minister and who was supposed to be in the evening. I will take a look today on the, on Vesti and Novosti, who will be the next prime minister tomorrow. But my advice would be to stay the course of decreasing the military spending. 
I'm very positive about recent years uh, declining of mil relative military spending in uh, Russia. And when we are talking the fiscal position, there is still the room to, for instance, to freeze the nominal uh, spending on the military side and to transfer the money to support the uh, income <laughs> policy, fighting inequality, increasing the effective demand of the household sector and fueling the uh, demand for business uh, activity and so on. This is what is complexity in the mm, economy and the lacking segment on yesterday's speech of the, prime, of the president was um, actually not stressing the complexity when we are talking about horizons of economic policy, policy to the full, uh, to the full, uh, uh, to the full end. So the recipes for success is accountability, long shot approach, complexity, and unorthodox. And that is, I think, what is very important in the case of um, Russia's future too. Thank you. Thank you very much. The time of our session is drawing to a close, so I want to thank our speakers for their very interesting presentations, and I want to thank Ronipa for organizing this great forum. In conclusion, let me stress that uh, our economic policies do have their horizons, and this makes me think of an old Soviet joke. Uh, uh, where, uh, you know, where Petka is asking his commander Chibayev about the uh, horizons of bright Soviet future, and he says, well, horizon is this uh, visionary line that you keep going towards, but you never reach. Thank you.